Welcome to the Red Thread Redemption Podcast, where we are weaving the red thread of Jesus Christ as the singular redemptive message of the Bible. I am your host, Stacy Watford, and I hope that you're having a great Tuesday. Well, and let me go ahead and remind you too, uh, and thank you, first of all, for listening to the broadcast and also uh, following and subscribing and doing all those things that just kind of help us to promote this uh, podcast. We appreciate that very much. We have now been through from Genesis to Second Chronicles. We have gone from the Torah and into the historical books, and we have really basically covered the history of the Old Testament. However, there is still much more to deal with, and we are now going to enter into, for the next few podcasts, we are going to enter into the section known as Poetry and wisdom literature. These books cover the book of Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. So I'm very excited about this particular section. And of course, in this particular section, these various uh, wisdom writings and also Psalms and songs were scattered throughout Israel's history. So to pinpoint an exact date, which I know may be frustrating for some, but to pinpoint an exact date upon these certain things might be a little bit difficult. Not only that, I do want to go ahead and let you know, too, that uh, it's very well likely I'm doing, uh, we're going to weave the red thread of the book of Job today, just give an overview of Job, and of course, how that relates to our lives, and of course, ultimately to Christ. But then also, as we get into the book of Psalms, I'm going to have a special guest with me to talk about the book of Psalms and an overview of the book of Psalms. So you don't want to miss that. That's either going to happen this Thursday or possibly next Tuesday. So please stay tuned for that. Actually, now I want to go into the book of Job. And actually, before I get into the book of Job, I want to talk a little bit about wisdom literature. One of the words for the, a wise person is a sage. And a sage or a wise person makes observations about life, usually in memorable forms that deal with rules for success and happiness. And in this scope of poetry and wisdom literature, you have two types of wisdom literature. Number one, you have proverbial wisdom. These are short, pithy statements about life. That's what you find in the book of Proverbs. Uh, And although there are, and when we get to Proverbs, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but although there are small chunks of of scripture that, that may be consistent, most of Proverbs are exactly what we just said. They are short, pithy statements about life. Now, you can categorize those statements, but again, as you're reading through Proverbs, you'll notice that the writer really is just collecting a lot of these things and kind of all over the place with this kind of wisdom. And it's okay. That's fine. We'll get to Proverbs. But the one, the, the kind of wisdom that we're going to deal with now in from the book of Job is what is called contemplative wisdom. Contemplative wisdom basically narrates, it's a narrative which covers the basic problems of human existence. And there's a possibility that we have already seen some of this uh, in various Old Testament stories already. However, there is one large, uh, truly evidential uh, contemplative wisdom, and that is the book of Job, because it not only just covers just the basic problems of human existence, but also the problem of suffering. What do you do when suffering doesn't make sense? 
That's really the question that we are asking when we look at the book of Job. Now, one of the things that we deal with in the book of Job, and I won't spend a whole lot of time here, but would be the date of writing. Some argue that it's a very ancient date, that even Job might have been one of the first Old Testament books to be written. Um, some refer to the fact that uh, Job performed his own sacrifices. He was much like Abraham and Jacob, and in which their wealth was measured in possessions of livestock and servants. Um, just some other things. And then there's some who argue for a late date um, and even comparing him to the time of Jeremiah or a post Second Temple kind of um, uh, writing. So, so you have those things. But more importantly, the interesting thing, the thing that everybody really gravitates toward the book of Job, either, either they go towards it or they stay away from it, is because Job is about suffering and serving God. That pain has the power to radically alter the spiritual and emotional life of a Christian. And the relationship between suffering and the art of serving God is explored in the book of Job. You could say that Job is actually the case study of a man who has suffered and was counseled through his suffering. We know that Job was a powerful, pious man who the Bible says fears God and shuns evil. In fact, interestingly enough, it is his good character that starts a heavenly discussion over his motivation. Remember that the Lord has been holding counsel, and we don't know all of the realms of, of the heavenly places, but evidently there is a realm of heavenly place where Satan is allowed to talk to God, and Satan basically basically says, listen, if you will uh, just strike Job down, he will curse you. And actually, before Satan does that, remember, it is the Lord who raises the issue of Job's integrity. And by the way, who is Satan? Who is this, uh, this individual, this character in the book of Job? One of the things that's interesting within the Hebrew writing is that his name in the book of Job is Ha-Satan. Ha is the definite article, although you don't say the Satan. Satan's name means accuser. In other words, he is the accuser and he is sent to test Job. The accuser tries everything he can uh, possible to attack Job and destroy him. In fact, just going through uh, the initial uh, losses of Job, we have several things. A group called the Sabaeans killed all of his children. Lightning strikes and kills the sheep and some of his servants. There are a band of Chaldeans that carry off his camels and his other servants. And then God's mighty wind destroyed the remainder of his family. And there's a question right there is that, is it possible that God even himself is involved in this suffering? Well, how does Job respond? Job responds in Job chapter 1, verse 20 and 22. Then Job arose and tore his robe. He shaved off his head, fell on the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked shall I return. Listen to this. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all of this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. 
And this is interesting because of the fact of that one phrase the Lord gave. Now, we love it when the Lord gives. We love it when the Lord blesses. We are very much affirming of the sovereignty of God in his good deeds toward us. But listen to the rest of what Job says. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. And it's at that kind of thinking that we must think to ourselves that something has gone wrong. Maybe there's sin in my life. Maybe there is some unfairness in God. No, folks, the sovereignty of God, Job recognizes his sovereignty and says the Lord gave and the Lord ta has taken away. I will still bless the name of the Lord. Job continues in the book of Job and his feelings now, his actual misery uh, of what he went through uh, really is uh, quite devastating for just one human to feel. When you consider the Bible talks about in the book of Job where Job says if vexation, if troubles could be weighed, it would be heavier than ocean sands, not sing sand, but plural, pound upon pound of ocean sands. A couple of other descriptions of Job's misery throughout the book of Job. His face was red with weeping. He had infected sores from head to foot. He was covered with maggots and scabs. His flesh was dead and open and broken and festering. His skin was blackened and peeled off as he scraped uh, his skin with a pot shirt, which is a broken piece of pottery. His body burned with fever and he was so emaciated that he was nothing but skin and bones, shortness of breath. He had what was called the boiling, which basically is a combination of diarrhea and nausea and reflux. Uh, some one of my students said he was really going through it. That's that's the misery that that Job is experiencing. But not only how does that affect one's mental state? How does it affect one's mind as they are going through these difficulties? Well. Job, in his actual feelings, the uh, the book of Job says much about this in chapters uh, 7 and 30, in chapter 6, chapter 10, chapter 19, and chapter 23. Job had no peace of mind. He tossed, he turned, and he was terrorized with nightmares. He had no thoughts of happiness or no meaning to life. He he actually wanted to die. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. Job felt abandoned by his friends and what little friends he had. <clears throat> they really accuse him of some things. And we'll touch on that in a minute as well. Job felt that God was personally after him, that he was being chased and hunted by God Almighty. That God was treating him like an enemy. You can read that in Job chapter 19. Most of all, Job felt powerless and helpless and afraid. The Bible says that Job never cursed God. He never sinned against God. And yet the Bible also says, and Job says this as well, that he cursed God the day in which he was born, that he actually says, oh, I wish I had been stillborn. I wish I had died in the womb. I wish that, that my mother had never received me to life. This is him cursing the day of his birth. And what it basically boils down to is it was a way of rejecting God's creation, the, God's working in his own life without rejecting the creator. It was, in essence, a way for Job to hate God's actions while continuing to serve God. It is the closest thing that came for Job to come to the edge of denouncing who God 
was and even God's activity. And if it was not bad enough that Job questions and, and curses the day he was born, Job really has some very much disturbing mainstream therapists. Their names were Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. And of course, with names like that, I mean, uh, who, who, who would want to trust them anyway? Uh, but here they are, and their main diagnosis, their main diagnosis is they all believe that Job's problem was sin. There must be some kind of sin in your life for all of this trouble and sorrow. Now, I, I want to be very clear here, is that you, you cannot separate the fact that we live in a sinful, fallen world, and that the things that happen to us are a result of depravity and sin in this life. However, not everything necessarily is directly related to sin. Not everything we go through is directly related to our own personal actions of sin, okay? Sometimes they are. Sometimes we go through, we commit acts of sins, and we have to reap the consequences of those things. However, sometimes, we, to, to, to put in a generic understanding, life happens. In other words, let me put it more now theologically, the sovereignty of God and also the sinfulness of this world allows for life and trouble and sorrows and sufferings to take place. Eliphaz says that basically you're reaping what you sow. You sowed some sin and then you are reaping the suffering. And that's one possibility. Zophar said basically Job was not being honest with himself, that maybe there was some, some kind of secret sin in his life. That's why all of this suffering is going on. Um, Bildad says that not even the, the moon and the stars are pure. Job surely isn't either. And again, you must understand that, yes, you're right, that Job, Bildad is right. Job is not perfect. He's not sinless. The only one who is sinless is God Almighty, who is Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Yet Job's actions did not produce this misery in his life. Finally, after all of those have, been, all of Job's friends have been talking, and his wife says, "Why don't you curse God and die?" Finally, the answer comes in what we call a theophany, a revelation of who God is. God comes down in the whirlwind, and God, when He comes down in the whirlwind and He begins to speak to God, He says, "Where were you?" when I made the heavens and the earth? Where were you when all of these things? Now, notice some of the things that God doesn't do. God doesn't charge Job with sins that have brought him as suffering. He doesn't respond to the whys of Job's suffering. He doesn't challenge Job's defense of his own integrity. God calls into question Job's willingness to condemn God in order to justify himself. In other words, God, I have done nothing wrong. Is this a simple, is this, a, is, is God's answer with him saying, I've created this and I've created that, is it satisfying? See, in much of our secular Christian thought, we assume that everything that takes place in God's universe ought to be explained to us. We assume that God Almighty should be more interested in giving us explanations than for us uh, in, in our worship and to trust him. When God finally gets through talking to Job, Job's response is this, and here is where I want to leave us at. He says, my ears have heard you and my eyes have seen you, therefore I repent. 
See, Job teaches us and reminds us that there will be mysteries to suffer, uh, mysteries to suffering that we will not know about, but we must exercise a true faith in Christ who walks with us, who leads us, whose grace is sufficient for even our suffering. I hope that you have a good week. Uh, this week, God bless.